All right. So today we are together with uh, Bria Bloom, whom we contacted because um, she is working with the Alliance for Self-Directed Education. And I was like, I want to know more about that organization. Uh, but first, uh, I got an email around an hour before uh, the call today from Bria, where she was like, oh, I might be a little tired because you have been up all night with your baby. So let's start there. How was your night? <laughs> uh, I think she's teething because she kept waking up crying. Um, and it's funny because I have like a week where sleep goes really, really well. And I'm like, oh, maybe we're over this hump. And then it's a week of this. And yeah, I've done a lot of podcasts and work tired over the last <laughs> year. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of parents can relate <laughs> to that one. Um, yes. You just keep going. It's just yeah. part so, of life. So how many uh, children? Um, Two. This is the first one I've birthed. So the other one is my stepson, but he's been living with us since he was six, probably, and he's 12 now. Yeah, ah, yeah I have kind of the same experience Cecilia had her first uh, without me and we met when uh, our daughter is uh, wow. was five uh, mm -hmm. and I adopted her later and it's just a wonderful experience but also kind of you just get thrown into uh, kind of being a parent already and that yeah. was for me that was wild I needed to change my life around from being a, a young party animal to suddenly <laughs> have responsibilities where Normally, that might be like a nine-month leeway. Can I say yep. you took your time? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> More than nine months. <laughs> and I, I took, I absolutely <laughs> took. You know, yeah. You could check in and out. Oh, yes. For the first year. Oh, yes. Do it, whatever you wanted. And, and it you was could wonderful. the stepdad thing. <laughs> you were not too hungry. Yeah. <laughs> I did not get to check in and out. We were pretty adamant that he wouldn't go to school when he moved here um, for many reasons, but it was like immediately I quit one of my jobs and stayed home with him and yeah, immediate mother situation and did wow. not get to check in and out. So that was a harder adjustment. I agree. Having the nine months and for some people, the planning before that is an easier thing to process, but it's so, not always what you get. No. Ha and then still it is, it is a revolution when the and it's still a revolution. Yeah, at least you I can didn't prepare and you can read all the books and you can knit all the little cute things. But <laughs> at the end of the day, when the baby arrives, it's just going to completely run over your life and change everything. Yep. Yeah, and they're all different too. So exactly, but I think the first one, this moving of the center of your life and your attention and your focus from yourself which makes perfect sense before you have mm -hmm. children, you, you you do you then suddenly you do someone else something else right. is in 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 the core of what happens someone else is even the sleep now we actually started this conversation about sleep the fact that you can only sleep once someone else is sleeping right <laughs> No, yeah. you, you don't have a choice. It's a basic thing. You need to sleep, but actually you're not allowed. You can't. There's no way you're allowed to fall asleep while your baby is awake. So that premise that even your physical needs cannot be met, they are dependent on this other person. It's a revolution. And that revolution happens the first time. Yeah. yeah. It's game over after one. Mm-hmm. Bria, for the people who don't know you and the work you do, um, why have you ended up working with the Alliance for Self-Directed Education? Yeah, so I essentially was an unschooler growing up. Um, we didn't have or use that word. We talked more about homeschooling. My dad read like John Holt and the Teenage Liberation Handbook. Those were kind of the two things <laughs> accessible widely at that time. Um, and then the homeschooling movement was very uh, religious and conservative, which there's still those pockets for sure. Um, but that was like my realm of understanding of what homeschooling was. Um, but that's not what it was for us. So I kind of already like I like to think that I had those values and that way of seeing the world in me. Um, and I really wanted to work with young people who are learning. 
I started out in preschool because it felt like the place where the school system hadn't quite touched it. Yeah. Um, but it really has, <laughs> at least in the U.S. It has. Uh, I tried my best to work in like places that valued children and were play based and didn't do like a curriculum really. Um, but still, there's still that thing in us that thinks a kid is ours to control and mold. And that's very evident in preschool a lot of the time, especially because they're even younger. So it's like even more of an excuse to override their needs with yours. Um, so I worked in preschool for a while and then I just, I kept tuning into the alternative education realm. I didn't quite know unschooling very well yet. And I met Peter at like a conference in where I live now, which is Portland. And they were kind of pitching the Alliance for Self-Directed Education. It was just in its beginning stages. It hadn't been really announced yet. It was the first time. We were talking about Peter Gray. Yeah. 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 Thank you. (laughs) No, 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 no. Thanks for the clarification. There's a lot of Peters, especially floating around the <laughs> education movement. Talk about schooling and self-directed. There is a Peter that sort of stands out. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, and I went up to him with Peter with like an idea to pitch to the Alliance. And he was like, great, email me. Uh, and it's funny. I, yeah, I think I told this story recently but I kept it under wraps for a while I was like so scared to email Peter that I didn't follow up for six months because I was so nervous about it um which doesn't feel real now because that's not I've changed and I'm not really intimidated by people in that way anymore because we're all people you know um yeah so I emailed him six months later and they were like we're still interested in this and that's how I got involved and just over time got more and more involved yeah I do think that something my dad kind of instilled in me throughout my unschooling process was like, if you want something, ask people for it, like pitch the idea, ask for it, no matter who it is, the situation. And like the worst thing that can happen is someone is going to tell you no. And rejection is hard, but I think you get used to it. Like if they tell you no, it's really that the idea doesn't fit or maybe that's not the right place for you. It's not really... A personal thing that you're wrong it's just not the right fit um and I think I just practiced that a lot so when it came to just talking to Peter about an idea even though it took me a while to follow up um I think a lot of my unschooling really played a role in being able to do that and just just try of course and for for people who don't know the work that their lines for self-direction directed education do can you put some words on it uh, so people are up to speed with it yeah. Um, so essentially ASD, which is like the acronym, the people who started it saw these disparate groups doing self-directed education, unschooling different ways. They saw, you know, unschooling people outside of centers or schools. They saw Sudbury schools or agile learning centers or co-ops um, doing this. They saw like individuals advocating for it, even teachers and schools advocating for it, even though it can't, in my mind, really live in a conventional school the way it does outside of it. There's still teachers there who believe in these things and are trying to think through different ways to bring them. Um, And as you want to be an umbrella to like bring everyone together, because it felt like everyone was kind of even like there was some talk amongst different centers and unschoolers about not getting along with each other or judging each other. And as you just wanted to bring all these people together and say, Hey, we all believe in like this self-directed education thing. We're just doing it differently from each other, but can we unite? So this is a movement support each other. Um, and then, yeah, the essentially like supporting each other and, uniting under one umbrella will help spread the movement because it's a lot harder when you're like isolated or when you're fighting each other or bad mouthing each other which some people were doing still do yeah and also the fighting of each other and the it can be very harmful for those who are beginning i find Mm -hmm. where it was for many years, so we've been unschooling. We started as um, well laid back homeschoolers, and and mm-hmm. 
did the transition to unschooling within I don't know a year or whatever yeah. it, like lots of people do mm, but I remember when I I started unschooling listening to some of the experienced unschoolers there were so many ways I could do it wrong Mm-hmm. I got yeah. really annoyed and then I said okay fuck it I'm not unschooling yeah. I, I'm not having these discussions. It's not interesting. I'm I'm living my life with my kids in a way that makes sense for us. Yes. And mm-hmm. if you say I fuck it all up by saying X Y Z or having this opinion or emotion or whatever, I'm not having. And it it was online, obviously. Well, I don't know if that's obvious, but when you're from Denmark, you have like two and a half friends who also unschool. Right. If you're lucky, because that's the entire unschooling population of the country was 10 plus years ago. So everything was online. But these discussed, I was interested in the movement, the idea, the philosophy. But then I got told off in a very rude and and not very... mm, well, yeah, in a not embracing way that if you do that, you'll ruin it. Or if you do that, you're not a real unschooler. And it was almost like I felt at that point, this is like a sect. It's like I have to, and I don't like rules. Rules. Yeah, it's dogmatic. Me off. So the, this rule, it was like, you know, we live this free thing. We believe in freedom and everybody doing what feels right. All of this. But there are these rules, and if you don't stick to them, you're fucking it all up. Yeah. So I took myself out of the equation, said, okay, I'm not an unschooler for quite some time, for something like five years, until I met an amazing unschooler who basically just told me, you can say whatever you are, but you're a yeah. radical unschooler. Own it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's still those groups doing that, especially. Yeah, but like, what I like yeah. about the alliance is, can we talk about what we have in common? Can we talk yes. about freedom? Can we talk about self-directed life for children and maybe also those who are above 18 years old? Mm-hmm. Uh, that it has to do with what we have in common and how we agree and how we can help and support each other. And that's what the movement needs. And that's what I didn't find in the beginning. That was why yeah. I was sharing the story. Yeah. And and one thing I just love about the name for the Alliance, which is also why we, we called our podcast Self-Directed, is um, that I have, I personally have had a little trouble with the word unschooling, where you define yourself against something, uh, where it, it is not, we are not not schooling, we are just living another life. Um, yeah. but, but you said, have you, I'm just curious, Priya, have you ever been to school or how was your, how was your time? Because now it's your grown up and we love to see the grown up. Uh, now you become the case study. Now you become the case study. <laughs> Are, the you case. Are you normal? Are you normal? No, I'm not normal. <laughs> well, how are we defining normal? Mm-hmm. Um, I want to say really quick about the word self-directed. There's obviously talk about language and semantics and all movements. And I did do a podcast with like someone else specifically speaking about how ASDE named, came up with that term and why, and some issues with it. Um, so if you want to put that in your resources, if you're up for it, that's a good yeah. good thing to expand on that conversation. Um, very, it's a very interesting point. And I also, I agree with my husband that it's really annoying that unschooling is the word. I feel like right. I have to use it because it's the word that, it, that right. this is the word people use for the thing that I do, but there is no schooling in, I don't get up in the morning and not school. <laughs> you just get up and live your life, right? It's just life living. <laughs> it's just out of the equation and now it's out. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense that that's the word, but it is the word and, and about semantics, we also need to communicate in a way where we can understand each other. And as 95% of unschoolers call themselves unschoolers and only a very small fraction call themselves self-directed, or then we keep using that word, even yeah. though it's it's a little bit off. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go on. No, it's okay. Am I normal? No. <laughs> um. <laughs> But I think the question people really want to know is, am I happy and successful in life in the way that matters to me? Um, at least for me, it's in the way that matters to me. I think for a lot of 
schooled people, we don't focus on the self quite as much as we should. Um, but yeah, to me, what matters is what I want and how I'm feeling in my life and how I affect the others around me and how I can play out my relationships and support other people in relationships. And in terms of that, I feel like unschooling did me a great service for being a self-directed young person, whatever word we want to use. Oh, did me a great service. <laughs> yeah. Um, because there's just, I didn't have the sense of First of all, I didn't feel like it was me against the adults. I didn't feel like adults ruled over my world. The adults around me, I felt like I was equals to, and I could learn from them and they respected me and they learned from me. Um, and I think that's just like such an imperative piece of this that we miss is age mixing among youth, but also age mixing across the realm of age, like elders and babies. I know that we talk about age mixing and self-directed education to mean like five to 18, because that's the school age. But really for me, it's like the whole community and how we respect one another, regardless of where we're at with that. Obviously, babies have different skills than 80 year old elders. <laughs> like I'm, We are very different people in terms of how long we've lived, but there's still skills that each age can bring to each other um, that I think we're missing otherwise. And yeah, I guess you asked, have I ever gone to school? I'm trying to go back and piece through what the question was, but I have not really gone to like public conventional education as we stated in the US. I took like one class there, but I don't count that. It was like a choice to take one class. And then I went to like co colleges here and university. Um, and, and how was that transition? Yeah. From, was it wild or? It was fine. <laughs> I was, I went to a, what we call community college at 16 um, because it, we, I could get in free as a high school age person. That's just how our state did it. And I was with all these 18 year olds who had probably like graduated from high school and gone to community college in these like beginning writing classes or whatever. And I was kind of astonished at how they weren't way ahead of me. I just thought everyone would be way, way ahead of me because I've only written a few hours of my life at that point. Um, and they weren't. And on top of that, they were so disenchanted with like learning in a classroom that they were bored and uninterested in the class class and and then the class was kind of like the classes I took were kind of boring but I was it was a little bit new to me so I was a little bit more invested and I had chosen it um yeah so it just didn't feel like this big jump it didn't feel like anyone was way ahead of me and it was actually like confusing to me because I thought that they would know all these things I didn't and they really did not the key yeah. word is that you chose it right it's it, whenever it's voluntary I mean, it, unschooling and self-directed philosophy is not about being against education, not mm -hmm. education. For me, at least, this, the center of it is that I am against violating the free will of other people, including mm -hmm. my children. And if it's voluntary, it's different. So, yeah. so right now our two older well our two middle children who are now teenagers they have begun studying for the equivalent of a high school degree mm -hmm. but online because they don't want to be in a formal situation and we're also traveling um and it's completely voluntary they study because they want to and yeah. that's not a, that that that's not a a radical transition because you know just like they played board games five years ago because they wanted to now they study math and languages right. because they want to and and as it's voluntary there's no violation of their person involved and mm. and I think therefore the transition is not that radical yeah it's so much different with the teenagers then with small children, you tell them what to do and they have to obey all day and they don't know why and no one's telling them why and maybe no one knows why. And 
no one knows why that's the key <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah 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 I do think there's levels of voluntary even when we're talking about this because you can voluntarily go to college but would you voluntarily go to college if you didn't think that college would get you a degree to get you a job in the system we're in so like there's a little bit of the system requiring things of you for you to live certain parts of your life, I guess. Like I, now I wouldn't go to college to get a degree to be a lawyer <laughs> if I wanted to be a lawyer and didn't have to go to college to do that. Um, but because college is there, it's the thing we've decided you have to do to get there, then you need to go. And I think if there were other paths, like you can get to being a lawyer through college, you can get to being a lawyer through apprenticeship, you can get through there through self-study. Like if we had all these different choices, I think there's even more autonomy in that because the society is giving you different paths to get to the same goal. But right now I think society does narrow our path a little bit. And there is some like pressure to do that in order to get to the thing you want to do. I, I am uh, on the area you're talking. I am very lucky that one of the few places there are some places in different careers that you can be in where there still is this apprenticeships kind mm -hmm. of uh, wipe over it. Uh, I was um, interested in media and ended up as an editor of a youth magazine there you can still be lucky that you actually can get in because you are creative or can write. But now I also see most of the people uh, who wants to go in that direction, go through college first and then university and then something special. Um, and I remember I thought I needed the same. I, I had planned mm -hmm. to go to university and was applied and got in, but never started because I, I got a job inside journalism before I started. And my story is that during that first year, you I could postpone university one year. And I was like, okay, let me try this out. And during that year, I had to hire an uh, assistant. And I got applications from people who had taken the degree I wanted. And when I saw that, I was like, that's weird. I'm here now. Why should I use four years mm -hmm. or five years in university to get there? But I think that the the area have been closed down a little, uh, but you can still see it as entrepreneurs, you can still go there. And so there are roads to, to, to a career without, and I hope and believe that it's opening up uh, because I think also I see a lot of in the tech world where it's like, yeah, it doesn't really matter what degree you have. It yeah. matters what skills you have, have yeah. and, so so it, I think it I hope it will be no more more normal that people are tested before they uh, try to apply for a job um, to see they have to actually have learned anything. You can go 10 years on a university without learning stuff. And, and yeah. yeah, I usually say that. So I was at university for 10 years and have learned stuff. and I enjoyed it. I read a lot of books. I had uh curriculum of 5,000 pages twice a year. Yeah, I didn't go through all that. It's physically impossible. But um, I enjoyed it a lot. And I'm a big advocate for education. I think education, even formal education, when you're an adult and when, it, when it's voluntary, it's great. But mm -hmm. my, my main thing I, I always say about it is just, you know, you should do it because you want to study. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. The only reason to study is to study. If if you wake up in the morning with a hungry brain, then feed it. Right. If that what makes your heart beat. If that's what you find really interesting and fulfilling, and 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 you feel proud, and you feel curious, and you just want to go down another rabbit hole and figure this out and that out, and 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 your fingers itch to touch the next book. That's when you study. The mm -hmm. job afterwards, I didn't work many days in my life. I studied for <laughs> for <laughs> uh, ten years. I have worked a lot, but I I haven't had um what you would call normal jobs. 
and I haven't had uh, many paychecks, but it's not, I'm, I haven't been doing my nails and looking at the horizon either. It's just, um, uh, we have seen some horizons. Well, yeah, I'm just, I don't but together. talk no, no. myself down no, no, lazy. No, no. I've done a lot of things that I consider work. It's just no one's really paying me for it. And maybe mm -hmm. the money part is not that important either because I have this great guy who can bring in the money. So I think it's great to study, but I think we have to revise our motivation. Why do we mm -hmm. do this? And, and basically, we have to do that with uh, most things. We have to question, why is this a habit? Why do I believe this is a good thing? Yeah. Is this coming from me or from someone else? And, and and if it's coming from someone else, are they right? They could be right. You know, sometimes we are wrong. And, mm -hmm. and um, this is also the reason our kids are now just formalizing the, the studying they did already. They are in a, in a moment in life where they might as well get the piece of paper uh, yeah. in, in Europe, you can't get into university without that piece of paper. So as they are studying anyway, they might as well, you know, take the exams. And then in case at some point in their lives, they want to have a formal education, it will be easy. Yeah. They need to do three years of, of pre-university studying. Yeah. And, and that's a conscious choice they're making. And I still call it unschooling. They yeah. still consider themselves. Oh, yeah and they can totally not do it if they I, I might be annoyed if I paid for the exam and they don't go there but that's you know yeah, another yeah. story those are the levels of unschooling right. everyone has to work through on their own right if you pay mm -hmm. for it and they want to opt out afterward like there's so many of these little micro conversations yeah. among it's really parents. important it's just yeah so, so Bria, I have a personal question, um, but first I will share some of our own story. Uh, I was a small classical man. Cecilia came out first uh, and introduced me to that our uh, daughter uh, that I adopted should go to a, a like, hippie private school, and I thought that was weird, you know? <laughs> I thought it was. Uh, it was. Uh, Had a job, Cecilia. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was. It was a Don't great start schooling at the time. So this was the best. No, no, but uh, just to tell you where I came from, I was like, uh, "That is a private school. That's snobbish. Why do you want that?" And then it took me some time to understand that. Oh, it's actually because uh, they have some way of looking at the education that Cecilia believed in. I was still. That's a little weird and. When my son didn't want to go to school, uh, it was his choice. Uh, we wanted him into the same uh, self-directed school. I also thought that was a little weird and did the normal dad thing of, can we just do one year, uh, maybe one month and see how it goes? And now I'm sitting and advocating for it <laughs> so many years after. So that's where I came from. And my question to you is, you met your partner. Uh, and you you got a stepson how have you was he in the environment or what have you could you what did you do about the whole self-directed uh, thing was he on board or wasn't he and I think for someone my question and my idea is for someone being brought up on this way I would be like that would be a showstopper if he was against it maybe so can we talk about that so it's interesting you asked that because I think I knew on some level my kids would never go to school, but I don't, it wasn't something I was like bringing up consciously with everyone I met, no. um, which could have been super problematic if I got into some <laughs> very serious relationship. Which it was the first, on the first day, should the kids go to school? Yeah, should the yes. kids Okay, forget yes. about it. I'm off. <laughs> I think I did ask on our first date if he wanted more kids, because if he didn't, I was done. So, um, But it was a big part of my life right around the time when we met and started um, dating. So I guess it was just good timing. But so my husband did not, he dropped out of school and didn't have a degree, like a high school diploma or any sort of degree. He was extremely poor and had absent parents and didn't really have any options. Um, but it was, I think it was pretty clear to him already that school was ridiculous and wasn't helping him because of that experience. 
And then also because he has like a different lens on the world in general. And I think of this all the time, like if we're outside of the norm in terms of how we view jobs and capitalism and I don't know, there's so many and like parenting. And if you already have these one, this one way where you're questioning how we treat other people basically and how we live in the world, then it can extend to school. And I meet people all the time where it's like, they're questioning everything except school. So this isn't always true. So uh, though, isn't it? it? Yeah. It drives me it's what? really <laughs> it's like very like frustrating people, villages and alternative living and what's it called communities and people are mm-hmm. vegan and barefoot and whatever and Attachment parenting. they put themselves into the car they buckle up and they drive the kids to school and leave them there so right. freedom, is only, <laughs> freedom is only for adults i don't know it's just weird yeah yeah so yep. it and it is super weird but i think there's like openings at least for people thinking in that way and I was just getting involved with ASD when I met him so like my first meeting with ASD was when I was visiting him we were we lived hours away from each other um so I was like sharing all of this and really excited and he was really open to it so it was pretty natural I think his understanding of where I was at and he already had this idea that school didn't work. (laughs) Um, And that school kind of feeds into like, you know, this capitalistic lifestyle where we're just working to make money and we're miserable, um, at least here in the US. And yeah, and in Europe. And in Europe. Yep. So it was pretty natural with him. And then when Raiden, our son, decided he wanted to move in with us he was having issues in school like emotional um and social anxiety issues basically and he was really young he'd only been in school for maybe a year at that point uh but I was like the way to solve these issues is to take him out of school and I'm here and I did this growing up and I'll do my best and we'll adapt as needed and we really needed to adapt it was really hard um but yeah, that's what I said. And everyone was on board with that. Uh, even mm-hmm. like his mom was also on board with it. I think it helped that I had this backing of five years of working in preschool systems with young kids and then studying education and like that backing of legitimacy. Of security. Yeah. Yeah. It helped with his mom and then his dad just like trusted the process. And we had just been talking through these things forever. So Yeah, it was just, I think some people you meet and it's just in them, like questioning the school system is already in them. You just kind of need to bring it out. And then there's people you meet where, yeah, they're never going to listen. Even if they do all the things you were talking about, Cecilia, they're still going to hold on to school. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting. It's, it's such a big axiom. It's, it's such a big base understanding Mm -hmm. of life is. I also find it interesting when even even people who unschool sometimes say they should teach kids this in school. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> they should not. They should <laughs> let the kids go, and the parents should tell the kids what they feel they need to tell the kids. It's it's funny how it's in the language. It's in a common understanding of what life is, and it's. Yeah very very hard to take it out but it is also a very big part of life mm-hmm. it, it, it seeps into everything when you sleep what you wear how you feel in your body how when you, you shower how you feel in the shower what you read what you watch in the tv if you do watch tv which you do if you're in school because you know well how would you talk to people if you didn't um it, it's it's what books you read it's it's just where you live when do you go on a vacation when do you go on a date when do you go to the museum if ever can you visit your grandparents it's all elements of life are are very much influenced by school and school also spreads out i, I find it mm. i don't know if you have that in the states but on top of homework in europe at least in scandinavia we have play groups. This is social fascism, in my opinion, that the school dictates 
who the kid has to play with after school. And, no. and just to explain no. the logic. Yes. No, no, to yes. explain the logic from the school, then it's because they can see that the social the socialization of the group could be better if these two people here were more connected. So they suggest you play together. No. Oh, they make play Can you imagine groups. doing this to adults like you have to be friends with that person who yeah. you are every Tuesday with. you have dinner with these five couples yeah. every yeah. Tuesday and mm -hmm. we know what's best for you despite and that we're feeling very toxic you. for your birthday as well yeah yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. but this is outside of school time you have this we also have, I don't know if that's a thing in the States, but in Scandinavia, you have this portal online where parents have to log in every day to check if have that information COVID, from really the not. school. I mean, I aren't we like, it's enough now. Right. With the emails <laughs> yeah. and the WhatsApp and, and the text messages and the phone is ringing and there's so much going on that we're sort of obliged to look after as parents, but now we also have to check into this school portal and be interested in whatever the next mother says about uh, having an opinion on whether they can bring apples to school or not. <laughs> it, I, it could drive me completely insane. Yeah. 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 It, it makes you constantly think about school. Like your whole life is around school, not just your kids' yeah. whole life being around school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've met courageous people. I think it's amazing. I have a friend who's a single mom, and uh, I wouldn't say she didn't have the option to homeschool because I sort of think everyone could if they were willing to sacrifice whatever needed. But it's a little harder when you're divorced and the parent, the other parent is not on board. But oh, yeah. um, one thing she did was that she she put the child in the school and she said, you can have my child from eight to two or three or whatever the school hours are every day. She's not going to do any homework. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to enforce any rules that you have on my child at home or at school. There are rules, you know, they can't cut their hair or color their hair or wear the sneakers in whatever is that. There are always rules. And she yeah. just said, I'm not going to obey any of those rules and I'm not going to be your police. So she can do whatever she wants. That's my right. opinion. Yeah. And I will never, ever, ever log into that website to look mm -hmm. at, if you want to tell me something, you call me. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> And what was the last thing? Oh, yeah, I'm not showing up for any of your meetings or anything. Just telling you. Work? My free time is my free time. They yeah. listen to her? Yeah, the kid is 16 now. She That's never crazy. did it. And, well, yeah. she, she did have to fight for it, but it can be done. And that's why I'm sharing the story. At that, at mm -hmm. least, you know, you can say that the free time, the after school time belongs to the family, to the child and, and to yeah. your personal life. Yeah, but, yeah. but I think the story you're telling in me, it touches upon the non-questioning, which is uh, even though I mm -hmm. first thought the whole unschooling, homeschooling was strange, I have always been questioning uh, stuff. And I, I find it that that's what I find most wild about the whole school system is that people tell to you that this is how it is, and then they don't question if it's right or if it's wrong. Um, but I would love to go back to talk a little more about the the Alliance for Self-Directed Education. So if people are like, okay, the SD sounds cool, what can what can the organization do for people? What do people get out of knowing it exists? Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you want and what you're looking for. And it's always evolving. So there's like a bunch of projects we're thinking about working on now that aren't quite there yet. Um, but right now we have bi-weekly, I think we were publishing two a week, um, articles and videos on Tipping Points magazine. And that's just like stories from people like you and people like me, um, just doing what we're doing, living life, however it looks for them. So it's really varied. 
and eclectic what people are sharing on there. And then we also have videos from our SDE weekend, which are our once a year conference. So we charge for that conference. We make it accessible to people who can't pay, but we also take all of the videos and we release them for free over time because while we need to like survive as an organization, our goal is really just for all information to be accessible and free because people deserve it no matter what they can or cannot pay. Um, so yeah, we have those videos and those articles coming out twice a week right now. And then we have, we're growing, it's actually pretty large, but we have our resource directory um, because there's all these different places where you can find different resources, but there was nowhere where they were all collected together and they were only schools that were self-directed because people have like alternative education schools that includes Waldorf and Montessori and other ones where you can have some, some autonomy, but not really, <laughs> um, in my opinion. Uh, and in the definition of the Alliance, that doesn't count as self-directed education. So we're trying to really vet and see which schools are allowing the kids and supporting the kids in doing what's right for them and only listing those places. And it's global, so it's all over. Uh, and that list is constantly growing. So I'm not gonna say we have everything, but there's a lot on there. And then it's also, you know, books, podcasts, coaching, consulting, um, research, studies, all of that is on there. And yeah, constantly being added to. Uh, and it's all searchable. And there's also a map for you to look at things in your area. And then we have monthly groups that are now shifting to be, it's called like self-directed efforts. So if you're trying to start a school where you are, if you're trying to advocate, if you're trying to start a consulting group, if you just meet with parents um, informally, whatever it looks like for you, whatever you're doing in your area, you can come to that um, group and talk through it and get advice and ideas. And there is a lot of people there who are like, how do I start a school? Because there's a lot of like, you know, systems and hoops you have to jump through. Um, and people can give advice there, but there's also people just starting like informal co-ops and they want support on that. Uh, that's a monthly group and it's free to join. What else? We're publishing books right now. We published our first self-directed education fiction earlier this year. And then we also have a stack of Peter Gray's books that we've published and we're looking into a few more. It really like, we've heard from authors that if you go with standard publishing houses, they really water down the stories um, yeah. and what you're trying to do. So we wanted to create something that wasn't gonna do that and could be a place for people who can't find a publisher elsewhere, don't necessarily want to self-publish uh, but want sort of, yeah, some sort of name and collaboration on it. Cause we have, you know, editors that work with folks too. And then we have the SDE weekend that's once a year. It's a global conference. We try and accommodate every time zone we can. It's hard. It's like 6am for me and then like midnight for maybe people in New Zealand, but we do our best. Um, yeah, and that's usually in the spring. Uh, and then we just have a variety of like people doing different types of offerings and ask me anything panels. And as I said, we release all the videos we can over time to those if people didn't get a chance to attend. And now I'm thinking through everything that's coming up, but we'll when announce those as they okay. come. So if you subscribe to the newsletter, then you'll know what we do. That's the best thing people can do. Yeah. The next conference is in the spring, right? Yep. 2024 in the spring. There's also, I mean, I just get emails every day because I manage our main info email account from people who are like, how do I find someone in my area? How do I start unschooling? How do I start a school? Or I'm a researcher and I need to connect with people, like young people who are doing this for my research project. Like I just get tons of different types of emails all day long. Um, and I think that's a huge part of what we do that's really behind the scenes is anyone can come to us with really any question around this and we'll try and support them. And we're offering fiscal sponsorship now, which is just a United States thing, I think. So if you're not a nonprofit, because it's hard to get nonprofit status, we will take in grants for people and donations and then funnel it to them. 
that wow. just came out uh this week actually congratulations yeah because it's a good initiative it's wonderful yeah. and I, i'm thinking that how have you how many be years have you been connected and have you seen a difference in in the can you say the the um, reaction to it from the broader public uh, has there been a change during the years you have been connected with Asti? a little bit there's a little bit more like mainstream news on self-directed education and schooling especially during the pandemic because everyone was like we're homeschooling now but they yeah. they weren't <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah yeah <laughs> crisis schooling more like but uh yeah and then i know a lot of families just saw how their kids were treated by teachers during the pandemic because suddenly the classroom was like on the screen in their house and they're like oh this is how teachers treat my kids i understand now so people are kind of flocking to different ideas more because of that yeah. um so it's like the last three years i think things have shifted a lot in terms of public opinion it's just i don't know it goes up and down in waves i feel like Sometimes I feel like I can connect our movement to other movements that are going on. And sometimes, as you said, it's the school is the door that's closed. It's like, yeah, I'll think differently on everything except school. <laughs> it's pretty and frustrating. I've been sitting on another question, which is you who have grown up uh, primarily without school um, and being involved in this work. And now you have a wonderful little baby. Is this how do you draw from the experience you have? Uh, have what what thoughts have you made uh, towards how you interact with your child based on, on some of the things you have been through? Yeah, I mean, I think it's in everything. <laughs> I think how we interact with our kids and how we interact with the world is very closely related. Yeah. Um, and the people I know now and how they parent and how they raise children are so different. And they're like my support system. If I'm ever questioning, because it looks different, you know, for the mainstream looks so different. And I don't know what to do with babies. Cause I've never done this before. I'm just kind of trusting how my parents treated me and how I want to treat humans and going with that. But I still want to, you know, check in with other people who have had babies before and what it looked like with them. So just the people I've met through self-directed education are my support system in this. Um, and it's hard because, you know, you mentioned like school dictates everything. It dictates where we live and what we read and what we see. And I just never experienced any of that. Like when I look at people in neighborhoods, I forget that you live in a neighborhood and you think about what school is your neighborhood school here. Um, yep. And I just like forget that exists. And then when I'm reminded, it's so weird. Why would I choose where I live based on the school my kids are going to go to? It doesn't make sense to me. Why would I choose when I'm going on vacation based on the school year? Like, it's just not something that was part of my world. Um, so raising my kids a certain way was not something that was part of my world because it wasn't how my parents raised me and it wasn't how my friends, parents raised them. So it feels like it's very deep in me, like knowing how to treat a young person it's just been part of me because of how I was treated but then there's still you still slip up because there's all the societal messages coming in all the time and they infiltrate no matter how you were raised so I still have all of that to like wrestle with but it's a lot harder for me to describe how and why I do what I do because I just feel like it was part of how I was raised following nature yeah exactly yeah yeah. I think most people it would be hard to say how they would have been if things had been different. Of yeah. Course. It's Definitely. it's a very imaginative uh, theoretical thing. Yeah. I couldn't say either how my life would have been had I been unschooled. Around when we started looking into the home unschooling, homeschooling thing. I sat down and looked at the years we would have kind of been angered in that area based on the school mm -hmm. uh, uh, because we had our uh, now grown up daughter in 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 the, that school uh, and and it was something like 20 years we would have lived our uh, life you can count i mean 
she started school i can't even yeah that must have been in 12 12 yeah and uh our youngest child is still only 12 years not even 12 years old he's 11 yeah so he would be in school another five years yeah. something like that so that's like until almost 2030 I mean, we're sitting here in Spain, very far away. From <laughs> very far away, full time traveling for five years. <laughs> so. No, but I mean, we would still live there, and the yeah. prospect would be to live there another at least five years. Absolutely, yeah. and that is just wild that you, by choosing a school, choose to be not to be angered to this place for so long. Mm. And I mean, it's yeah, it just baffles me now when I look at it. But I was ready to do it at that point right. because that was normal. That was what everybody did, you know. And I do think that if there's no, like if you're in a place where you feel super isolated from other self-directed people and you want a center, then moving to go to a self-directed center, like the only one around makes a lot of sense. So I get why people make that choice. It's more like this is your neighborhood school and it's on every single for sale sign <laughs> in our area, like what the neighborhood school is. And I never even considered that as a factor for where I would go. Yeah. No. So um, before we have been talking around for an hour now and I'm thinking about rounding up the, the, the talk here, but I would like, you to also mention some of the other work you do betray, beside uh, SD and how you help people who who want to contact you. So, yeah, I mean, the work I do right now, there's lots of different things. <laughs> um, I like work with parents and families if they want to, you know, work through some of these things you're talking about, just starting unschooling or questioning unschooling and how to have support in what it looks like to kind of de-school and untangle what we've been told and rethink how we treat our children basically and what our relationship with them looks like. So it's like parenting and kind of self-directed education coaching. Yeah. Um, but that I use that term super lightly because it's different for everyone. It's, I don't have steps. I don't have like a curriculum or a system. It's like, what's going on for you in your situation right now? And how can we talk through that and just support parents and getting to a place where they just feel better about how they're interacting with their family and their young people. Um, I also run a flying squad for youth here and I co-run co-support the and flying just, squad like, when you like, say like, flying squad i'm like airplane so what are we talking I'll about get there. yeah it's the most ridiculous name but that's why we love it um so especially since we were talking about being anchored to a, a space in a schoolhouse flying squads are basically just like self-directed communities that come together without a building, um, without staying in one place. So they're in different cities. So it's like, I have one in Portland, there's one in Rom like Clue, Romania. Um, they're all over, but they're in different cities and we come together for the day and we just use the city as our place to live and learn and be. And the kids, we don't have any, it's not like a field trip. We're not like, okay, today we go to this place and tomorrow we go to this place. It's like the kids decide right there that morning where we're going and the adults don't decide for them. And they kind of, you know, they have to agree. They have to argue it out, whatever it is, um, come to a consensus. So there's a lot of those skills being built too, but it's, it's their place, it's their time and they get to decide. We take public transit. Not all squads are like that. Um, but yeah, we're limited by public transit and we're not paying a bunch of money to do everything every day. So the idea is to like get kids out in the community and take back the space and say that young people deserve to be in the community too during school hours and, you know, pushing on people's comfort level with having young people out during school hours. And it's just like such an easy thing to start because you don't have the overhead of like an, a building and a nonprofit and all these things we have to get if we want to start some sort of school or center. Um, so they pop up everywhere because they're so easy to start. It's a wonderful idea. And that's something people can get involved in if they want to start a flying squad as well. 
Yeah, we have flyingsquads.org is our website and it's like it's like run by the collective. So Brooklyn was the first flying squad and I was the second and we me and Alex kind of got together to start sharing what we were doing, but now it's just run by everyone who does it. So you'll see on there, you can contact different squads to ask questions and see how they get involved. What, what, what I loved about what you said about taking back the, the, the city space is when we, we travel full time and been doing that for five years. And then you really get out and about in, in normal lifetime when, when people are in school and at work. And it's crazy how the cities are sometimes almost deserted. Uh, yep. <laughs> and it's a little like you're walking around. So what are, what are this overpopulation thing people are talking about? There's no there's no there's one no, here. Everyone's <laughs> in their office buildings. Are in empty, schools, yeah. in their homes. And there's very much no one who is younger than 17. Yeah. yeah. There's babies and, uh, and senior citizens out. That's it. And it feels yeah. just really really weird yeah no but another very important element i find is that one of the best pieces of advice i think that can be given to a beginner someone who wants to adopt this lifestyle and there is a lot of de-schooling to happen for someone who has been to school and who maybe didn't think about it three months ago that this was even an option Mm. the best thing you can do is to make a friend Mm -hmm know someone who's done it maybe it doesn't have to be someone who's done it for 15 plus years or who was homeschooled themselves or just someone on the journey maybe a year or two yeah. in front of you maybe even just a few months in front of you talk to someone and and in person is always more fun than mm-hmm. online so if there is any way you can Find a homeschool, homeschooler, uh, unschooler, world schooler, self directed family anywhere close enough to go see them. I mean, that's one of the most empowering things that can happen in the beginning of this process. We mm-hmm. didn't have flying squads in Copenhagen, but we did have, was it monthly? I think we had monthly like every first friday of the month or whatever so i can't even remember the weekday it's been a while but we just opened our doors to anyone homeschooling or anyone even interested in homeschooling the only rule was that they had to have actual children that they wanted to homeschool so no 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 dreamers and no journalists and and then everyone could show up and we had and to- hang out in our garden space. Many people in our house. We had so many people come in and out. And it was actually at some point too much because once a month, if it's 50 people, it's a lot. So we uh, we, we shared it with another family. So it was every second month that helped a little bit. But just to say that if someone sits there and thinks, what can I do for the community? Mm. It could be open your doors or it could be take an initiative that makes it available for beginners or even just curious parents who think they could never do it, but they might be interested anyway to meet real people and also see real children, real yeah. case studies, real human beings running around that didn't turn square or green or anything else weird uh, that looks like real people. Yeah. And I will say ASDI has a member map. If you are a member and you opt in, there's a map that will show up where different members are so that they can contact each other and have that connection you're talking about. And I get people emailing me saying like, is there anyone in my area? And I can like search and ask for permission to connect people Mm -hmm. too. So Mm -hmm. yeah, because that really is, if you're completely alone and isolated, how do you find at least one other person in your area to support you like that's important and i think that's part of what game changer. Do. what it can be a complete game changer definitely have someone yeah. to talk to. yeah 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 all right well, uh, it is time I, I would like you to to mention uh, where people can contact you and sd so uh, i will also put it in the show notes but for the people only listening so if you can uh, give us some urls so people out there can get in touch and send you even more emails uh, yep <laughs> <laughs> me personally is bria bloom my name um dot com 
and that has flying squads. It has a de-schooling group that meets online once a week. It has my coaching. It, it has a bunch of stuff. Um, and then ASDI is self-directed.org. And if just full disclosure, if you contact the info email there, it will also go to me, but I'm feeling different from different places. And I have, you know, a group of people that ask and support in those emails too. And then flying squads is flying squads.org. Yeah, I think that's everything. I have different email addresses everywhere too. So you will, you will get to me by emailing like five different things. Perfect. Don't be surprised if it ends up at my, my and inbox. And yours does. All the emails go to, to you. you. Yeah. <laughs> Flying squad's info emails do not, luckily. So that's perfect. I gave up but, when the big was But in. Priya, it was a wonderful pleasure. And for the people out there listening, uh, go check out Priya's work and the ASTI and the Flying Squads and get involved. And uh, if you are on the journey, as Cecilia said, uh, go find someone, real people talk to because... Um, or be someone. Or be someone who shares. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks a lot for your time. Hope you get Thank some you sleep. So <laughs> yeah. Someday. <Yes. laughs> Okay, bye. <laughs> Have a lovely day.